I apologize for my webcam. It's been acting wonky lately since I reinstalled it, and uh, the color is kind of hard to manage, and now I'm getting this sort of delay choppy thing, so, well, you know how I am with editing videos. Um, <clears throat> a lot of interesting points came up in the last 24 hours or so, uh, both in Inmendum's video and in uh, a few comments that I got. Um, now, I guess to sort of reiterate where I'm going with this, let's say that we don't challenge any of the assumptions that I guess an antinatalist would say um, would raise to existence or to living or to um, what would you, how would I characterize it to perpetuating uh, existence and this is quite beyond the objections say that how do we know whether or not consciousness is really not just a thing in itself or just an emergent property of matter energy whatever okay that let's forget about that for now um, let's say that what um, what Plato I guess and to a certain extent uh, um, the Bhagavad Gita uh, Sapfi even Nietzsche would say that if you actually manage to perceive reality without abstraction what would what you would get would be something like a perceptual shovel in the face it would simply be enough to overwhelm you possibly drive you insane possibly kill you the moment of becoming where you're just in the driver's seat of what you know I always refer to um, um, Pyro's information stream it's the metaphor he likes to use where you know you just there you are and you're you are a, that which perceives that which is happening and you're perceiving it completely free of abstraction um, I won't say that it's an enforced ignorance um, but it's an enforced or a, a cultivated I guess um, a cultivated ignorance a cultivated non-evaluation um, you're trying to I mentioned the metaphor of the moving car so the normal view of things the thing the the way of time perception that seems to come most naturally to most people is when you're looking through the rear window of a forward moving car and reality is going by like this um, now I think that just sort of happens as it were if if you sort of don't question any of your perceptions all the stuff of the past becomes in some sense real to you when in fact it's difficult to demonstrate that the past is real um, it's also difficult to demonstrate that the future is real uh, because the future well what is it um, it's an abstraction as is the past um, so it, it's it's a way of seeing as I say the best possible way I could explain it is someone who's had their short and long-term memory completely dislocated or uh, shut off or whatever like they're just not able to store any information at all and they have no information stored but they're still conscious you see everything but you have no idea what any of it is you place no value on it positive or negative you just what is all of this that's I guess what that would be the moment of becoming that was that would be when you're actually seeing things for what they are uh, that's when you're as I say you're turning around and looking over the driver's shoulder through the windshield into what's coming but again when you turn around there's a you're doing this on purpose with a certain set of circumstances you're doing it on purpose because you want to see you want to see um, reality without Zapfi's anchors distractions sublimations that sort of thing you don't want any of that um, the way that it's described in the East is you're trying to strip yourself of all your karma all the stuff that's clung to you um, and 
Phoenix Chastain asked me wh why not use instead of being just sort of a a um, person looking through the rear window while somebody else drives, why not be the driver? Yes, but being the driver kind of implies an element of control that I'm not sure that we have because um, I'm not I keep using the word determinism but it's not so much that I'm saying that I believe in the normal sort of vernacular version of determinism um, what I'm trying to say is to Phoenix is that we're, I'm not trying to say that you can seize control of reality um, and and manipulate it to what you want. I don't think you can do that. Um, it looks as though you are. It, it almost seems as though you are, and, and it's often described that way, that you're actually taking control of reality when you are in the moment of becoming, and you, you're actually in the moment of riding that tiger. Um, it feels as though you've taken control of it, because you've actually deliberately brought about the situation where you are just in the moment, period. There's no abstraction whatsoever, past or future. None of that. You're just pure perception, I guess you'd call it. Devoid of any sort of interpretation or anything. I'm not talking about... Although, to actually do that, you have to intervene to do it, to get that done. I suppose brain damage might do it, or drugs or something like this. But what I'm saying is you want to deliberately bring that about. Um, that's why you have the, the metaphor, I guess. That's why the, the terrifying images come in. Um, the obvious one is Mother Kali, where you sort of say, okay, these Hindu people, they're worshipping this horrifying goddess. They must be pretty horrible, or whatever. Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom type thing. But no, they're just sort of saying that what you see at first isn't going to be necessarily what you think it is. So you'd better be ready for this, in, in as much as anyone can possibly be ready. Um, because you might, if you go in there thinking it's going to be some sort of blissful event, it, it, you might be in one heck of a shock when it does happen. I guess it's the same thing as a bad acid trip or something. You know, nine times out of ten you think it's great fun, and then on the tenth time you have a terrifying episode that causes a psychotic break or something like this. Um, you know, it, it's you're, it, it's unpredictable, I guess. And that's, again, Kali. She's equally horrible and equally wonderful and equally loving and equally violent. That's the way I see it, as a sort of completely non-theistic, purely poetical thing. Um, I don't believe in any gods or any woo or anything like that. Now, that's one interesting point that was raised. The second one is that... Um, This, the way that I'm trying to describe what I mean when I say determinism, and I guess what I would say is, I guess I would use um, the ancient Greek or the Nietzschean version or the Heraclitan version, which seems to be, I think Heraclitus seems to have originated this, or at least in terms of codifying and diffusing it throughout you know, Western thought. Um, necessity as opposed to determinism. Now, the two are close to each other, I would think, because um, both are out of our control. What is necessary is what must be, what is. Now, again, necessity, I would say, is determinism, but in a first-person perspective, in a first-person experiential pers pers perspective, from a per first-person experiential perspective. Necessity is, if I just stop right now, contemplate my existence, and say, what is right now? That which is out of my control, completely and utterly out of my control, it just is. That's necessity. Now, it could be all of that was determined, um, maybe. But what I'm saying is, it's not so much the process that I'm talking about, but the particular set of circumstances that you find in the moment. Um, necessity. And 
I'm going to try and adjust the brightness. It's getting bright out. Um, so you get um, you get you get kind of snared a bit when you're trying to discuss what you mean. But I think I think we're making progress. Um, now. That's why I'm saying that I'm not sure that I would completely agree with Phoenix Chastain's metaphor of driving versus just looking, because I'm talking about perception. Um, if you were the driver in this case, I would have to say that you have some way of actually manipulating necessity. Well, if, if you can manipulate necessity, then it isn't necessity, right? Necessity is that which we cannot control, that which just is in the moment of becoming. Um, even stuff that I have done in the past is now necessity. It's now just the way things are. I've done all these other things in the past that I can't undo and they just are there now and that's that. I'm not talking about any sort of moral issue here. I'm talking, you know, or guilt or whatever. I'm just saying that this is how things are. Never mind why. They just are this way. That's necessity. That's Krishna telling Arjuna at the battlefield of Kurukshetra, look, you can like it or lump it, Arjuna, but that's just the way it is. That's necessity. Right here, right now, in this present moment. Um, so, uh, can't seem to get the, get the color right here, sorry. <laughs> I guess I should really give up and just let, sort of let it go. Um, but, um, yeah, so it, it isn't... It isn't so much a process as a set of circumstances that I refer to when I say the determined universe or the d determined reality or whatever. I, I may even have intervened to, to determine things but my intervention in the past has now become necessity because I no longer have control over what I did in the past. That's one thing. The second thing, which is kind of interesting, is that in Mendham uses this image of a snowball. Now, that's interesting. That's kind of... It's subtly different, but it kind of reminded me of the Jane image or the Jane version of karma. Now, I, I, I don't. I understand what the term karma does in most people's minds. You sort of think of some corny, golden rulish kind of thing, where you know there's this thing out there called karma. You know, karma is a bitch or whatever. Um, that that's not how I see it at all. What I see it is just cause and effect. No. The Jains see karma as something... It's often described as physical, but it's not necessarily physical. It's memory as well as that which is physical. The image that is used is um, how dust clings to a greased surface very slowly over time and coats the surface eventually. Say, imagine a light bulb. You ever seen one of these old um, uh, light bulbs? They're still around. They actually are bulbs. And, um, you know, as they sit there over time, they get this coating of dust on the upper side of them. And then it, over quite a while, it can get pretty thick. That's how the Jains describe the accumulation of karma onto the jiva, which is the individual consciousness. Um, they describe it as a physical thing, simply because it's not consciousness. So there, it, it, it's not physical in the sense that we understand it. I would say it's more phenomenal than physical, because the, the, the Jains put it this way. They say there's consciousness, which is jiva, and then there's everything else, which is ajiva. So your consciousness is um, that which perceives, and everything else is everything else. Now, everything else clings to consciousness over time, and it does sort of get bigger and bigger, like in Mendham's snowball. Uh, now, he, I don't think he was talking about consciousness so much as, as I guess, just the causal chain in and of itself, which 
again i talk about the causal chain but in a sense that's kind of a misnomer to what i'm referring to because the point of all of this is to get off the causal chain um, now if you can get off the causal chain what does that mean you know uh, what does it do to your view of the causal chain if it's something that you can that something can opt not to be part of that go back to my thing about the moving car you want to turn around and look over the driver's shoulder into the future into the face of existence into the very face of becoming but you you do this on purpose and at the same time you don't want to remember all that stuff behind you all those things that you uh, your your view of time that you had before you want to completely change your view of time you don't want the past back there anymore you want to strip yourself of all of that you uh, you want to see reality for what it is as opposed to all the abstractions the abstractions I think killed Zapfi's caveman instead of or they would have killed one of Plato's prisoners thrust up into the blazing sun um, existential panic um, when all of your anchors are gone you fly into a state of existential disorientation if you abolish the past completely you have no means of interpreting the future and what I'm saying is we're deliberately trying to as it were abolish the past um, deliberately trying to delete it all, delete our hard drive and start all over again, delete everything on there. Um, so that's an interesting metaphor that in Mendham used. Now the the objection that I would raise to that um, that metaphor is we don't really have a coherent point that says this is the past and this is the future. There's no sort of measuring point to say um, like that, that to me that is kind of like I agree with him in a way that the present kind of doesn't exist because all that the present is is the intersection of the past and the future the point on the causal chain where you know, again if we're going to flip back and forth between linear and and uh, non-linear perceptions of time it's going to get confusing but um, I'll try to be as coherent as I can on this. It's not easy a thing to talk about. What is the difference? Where's the where's the fulcrum between the past and the future? That's us, I think. Uh, that's consciousness. And consciousness um, is the only sort of anchor that we have that seems to be more or less reliable. Um, what is the uh, what is the, the 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 fulcrum that determines the difference between the past and the future is us because there in in if we were to look at time in a completely linear fashion there is no past present or future um, because there's no fulcrum there's no vantage point from from which we can tell the difference between the past and the future something has to decide what's the past and what's the future and again that something is us uh, or not us in terms of us the organism or whatever but just consciousness perception I guess um, so that's an interesting um, way of, of illustrating I think the difference between the moment of becoming and just this view of one's consciousness as just a dot on a point of a long line uh, perhaps a moving dot where you can actually see what's behind and what's ahead you're using what's behind to interpret or to prepare for what's ahead etc etc I'm saying that that the aim of or what my aim is is to see things the way things are without abstraction the past and the future are abstractions they are not real we can't demonstrate these things at all I've studied history all my life and no two people ever agree on what happened your own memory doesn't seem to be, keep an accurate track of what happened 
you may learn things as a rule of thumb to say, okay, this helps me navigate my existence. It, all that it really does, if you ask me, is it enables you to sort of maybe hedge your bets a little bit in terms of just succeeding in a finite thing that really has no reality to it anyway, i.e. our experience as individuals. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that necessity is a better way of describing what I'm saying than determinism. Because determinism has a whole pile of baggage attached to it. I suppose if you talk about necessity long enough, that can have a pile of baggage uh, attached to it as well, but I, I find it more apt. It's like, as I, I've used in the metaphor, a metaphor in the past, a fire hose right in the face. Things are happening. You have no way of knowing what's happening, but they are happening at a rate that is utterly disorienting. Um, and again, there's something of existential panic, or at least existential disorientation attached to that. Because things are, you have no means of interpreting anything, and yet things are happening all at once and immediately. Um, that's the moment of becoming. That's, um, as I say, that's the monster that you see when you look through the windshield, without the benefit of the past, to make you, to allow you to interpret the future. Because the way that we see the future is basically just a, a, a paid forward, I guess, version of the past. Um, when I watch, say, a Star Trek episode on television, I'm just watching the past projected into the future. I'm not actually watching the future. I'm watching what has happened, uh, but it hasn't happened yet <laughs> uh, type thing. It's kind of a screwy way to put this, but I think people know what I'm saying. Um, when you're telling a story, you tell it in the past tense, even if it's about the future. So... Um, you don't. When you're telling a story, you don't say this will happen and then this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen. You say this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. Even if you're telling a science fiction story uh, about something that took place in the future or that will take place in the future, you tend to talk about it in the past tense. What I'm saying is you just dislocate your ability to perceive all of that, and you do it on purpose, and you do it with a specific aim. That specific aim is to see things the way they really are, as opposed to um, using anchors to make sense, or not even anchors, I guess, um, crutches even, I would say, crutches. Um, the past is something of a crutch, because it, it's not real, and it doesn't really do anything for us except help us, I guess, avoid certain things. It doesn't really um, give us any indication as to what really is happening. Using the past efficiently enables us to cope, but it doesn't teach us anything. Um, it doesn't teach us anything because and the, the only thing that I would argue that is worth learning, or the only, or my aim here in all of this, is to just know what actually is the reality of it all. Um, now, I think a lot of people have get a powerful case of the existential jitters when you get into this discussion. I know that when I first started to really seriously think along this line, it kind of scared the hell out of me. Um, and um, I think that... Uh, that um, a lot of people run into that problem when they're trying to deal with this as well. When they're trying to... Sorry. My picture of my face just keeps changing so much that it's almost impossible for me. To, I really got to get a new camera, I think. Sorry. Um, when, um, when you get to... Um, when you start to see things like this, when you start to talk about things like this, people get freaked out, and you kind of freak yourself out a bit. You kind of, you know, you're deliberately throwing your crutches away. You're saying, I don't want these crutches anymore. I want to fly myself. Okay, how about the metaphor of flying? You want to fly? Okay, boom, now you're flying. <laughs> and you can't stop flying. What, what does that feel like? And not only that, you, you don't even know how to fly, but you're flying. 
Um, it's frightening, or it can be, I guess. I guess some people would just find it utterly liberating, like, wow. And they do say that, you know, the people who have actually claim, I guess, to have actually done this, and my own experiences tend to bear this out. Uh, they say once you get used to the initial shock of it all, the initial horror, um, keep going. As I say, um, I think Zappi tells a pretty compelling tale until he just sort of says, oh yep, then the caveman died and it just proved that life is pointless and ultimately a pit of horror. Well, no, I guess I would say just keep going. After you've, after you're the cave dweller in Plato's cave that you've been thrown up into the bright sunlight and you go crazy for a bit, okay, now that you've gone crazy, now what? Um, okay, you, you've been rendered permanently insane, maybe. Let's say that you haven't been rendered permanently insane. That, you know, you slowly get your bearings, or not that there are bearings up there, but you're at that level of seeing things, but slowly you get used to it. Somehow I've gotten used to dealing with this kind of thing. When I first started to meditate on this, when I was a much younger man, a couple of times I thought that I was really going insane, and meditation is not necessarily for the squeamish. There's stuff in there that you might not want to encounter, which, of course, as an impetuous young man, I discovered the hard way. A lot of people, I think, discover this the really hard way when they dabble in drugs. Um... Not so much the actual physical or mental effects of the drugs, or, but it's just what the implications are of you know, how the drugs force you to think whether you like it or not. You've lost control of the situation. In meditation, a lot of people say you're really just trying to replicate, um, or not replicate, but sort of do what drugs will do, but you want to do it in a way that's far more controlled. I think that that might be more accurate view of my view of meditation in terms of experience and everything. I'm going to say that when you do drugs, the experience that you had is real, even if it was brought on by totally artificial means. Because, you know, you can end up in the mental hospital from dropping acid. And you can't say that that's just an illusion if you went insane or you had some sort of serious psychotic episode or something like that. Um, might have been an illusion, but the illusion was a real illusion and it had real effects on you. So <clears throat> that's why I think that, yes, maybe what these people are saying, Zapfi and that group, even Ligotti, I guess, um, that um, life is, uh, or ex perception, once you strip the abstractions out, is a shovel in the face. But again, it doesn't stay a shovel in, a face for, in the face forever. The best remedy for fear is to simply... Um, persist. Keep going back to that which you fear and try and understand it. Go back again and again and again and again. That's what I've done for the last 30 years. I'm obsessed with the dark side of things and um, I'm trying to see what we'd call the dark side or the horrific side of things, the side of anxiety, the side of depression, the side of negative hunger, the side of suffering and everything, what that actually is. Um as opposed to trying to fight it or placate, you know, or whatever you want to call it. I just want to know what that is. And the best way to find that out is to continually go back to it and think about it and that sort of thing. And that's why I think, you know, the Eastern philosophies always say if you're going to engage in more existential forms of meditation, i.e. not therapeutic meditation meant to calm you down or anything, but you want to know what reality is, do it slowly and sort of methodically. And I've managed to do that. And I'm not saying that I've made any progress. All I'm saying is that I starting like what all these people say about meditation and everything and um, uh, say in tantric practices or in um, existential meditation type practices or existential contemplation, whatever you want to call it. Buddhists do this. There's a Western variant of this tradition as well something happens in your perceptions of yourself and your physical body and your surroundings and everything. And it is disorienting at first when you suddenly realize um, how much of stuff you're filtering and ignoring and sort of sublimating and this sort of thing, burying 
it's terrifying at first, or it can be, or you can have terrifying episodes, but keep at it, and slowly uh, you get used to it, and slowly you start to see it for what it is, and you start to get used to the disorientation. You become a real eccentric, I think. Like, I've been an eccentric all my life, and so I don't care. If I start thinking and talking in a strange way and people start looking at me oddly, I don't care. I, I, I truly do not. I don't care even if my closest friends do that to me or my family. It, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but it does happen. And you start to... What, what these people are saying when they talk about things like the monsters you'll find down there and the pit of yourself and everything, you, you start to get what they're saying, but you also get... You understand what they say, that it's not just monsters down there. Um, there's other stuff there. But you have to actually go down there yourself to do it. You can't have somebody explain it to you, because when somebody tries to explain it to you, what you get is that response that I always talk about when you know, somebody talks about Tantra. People say, you're nuts. Well, I can only say that you know I'll have to go back to Nietzsche. It's like... Um, those who were seen dancing were thought insane by those who could not hear the music. Um, unless you've experienced it, it's and I, I'm not. I don't claim to have experienced it. I, I, the, at the very best, I've gotten a small taste of it. And even then, how do I know if I have? And how do I convey that to anybody? Um, but again, it's just a question of understanding, and you have to. It's something that you have to work at. You can't abstract it. You have to actually work on your experiences. I don't know, this turned into a bit of a ramble, but um, hopefully we're making progress. Again, sorry about the uh, camera quality. <laughs>